Hi again, and welcome back. Today we're going to look at a topic that most of us are going to be involved with one way or another many times over the course of our lives, and that's insurance. Well, in this case, general insurance. Uh, and by that I mean things like property and casualty, homeowners insurance, car insurance, liability insurance. Today's session, as part of our personal finance course, financial planning course, <coughs> is, uh, is uh, going to cover some of the material that is in Chapter 8 of the uh, Madura and Gil textbook. It doesn't cover everything that's in that chapter. It does try to hit on some of the, the main topics. We will also be looking in later sessions at life insurance quite separately. We'll talk a little bit about that next week. We've all had some experience recently at least observing property and casualty insurance in action. Of course, we've had some of the biggest claims in history recently, including things like massive wildfires in British Columbia, and of course, the floods that we saw last year in the Fraser Valley. <clears throat> the insured cost of the, uh, of the floods that uh, affected people that lived in the Sumas Prairie ended up underwater. Probably will come to about $675 million dollars the total value of those claims. And that's mostly businesses that have uh, claimed that insurance because many of the individual homeowners would not be covered by any kind of flood insurance. That kind of coverage would come from the government. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, <clears throat> that's part of living in a high risk area and living on a, on a floodplain. And it, it, in a situation like that, it may be impossible for individuals to even be able to buy that kind of insurance. Again, we'll come back to that kind of thing a little bit later. Uh, on a much smaller, more manageable level, we are, all have some kind of experience with things like car insurance or boat insurance or liability insurance, or in this case, probably all three. You know, the, this particular claim, I'm sure, is going to be quite interesting involving uh, uh, boat insurance, the, the truck insurance, and, and then of course somebody's got to pay for the damage to the pole. And that's why we buy all of those different kinds of insurance. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the nature of insurance can be kind of complicated. Here's uh, an interesting looking situation, and surprisingly not that uncommon. And here we have a, a low wing aircraft that was obviously landing at this airport, and we have a high wing aircraft that was taking off, or trying to take off, and they've clearly collided. Well, the low wing aircraft can't see anything below it, the high wing aircraft can't see anything above it. And so it would be up to the underwriters to try to figure out who bears the liability. In this case, almost certainly, it's the aircraft that was uh, was taking off. They call this a, a runway incursion. <clears throat> he shouldn't have been on the runway. He should have been talking to people that were landing. So uh, this is all part of, uh, of that insurance business. And it's a very old and very well-established business. It goes back, in fact, probably as long as we've had recorded history. There are references to insurance type contracts in the Code of Hammurabi, <coughs> going back in, into ancient times. And modern property and casualty insurance, business insurance, liability insurance, <coughs> uh, it has been, well, it periodically observed just about throughout history. Of course, it gets complicated, and it still does in some modern situations, because insurance essentially is talking about probability, and in some societies that means we're talking about the will of God. So in some countries, even today, insurance and property and casualty insurance is restricted. Back in the 1600s, we saw the emergence of modern property insurance following the, the Great Fire of London <clears throat> in 1666. It destroyed a large part of the city of London. And one of the innovations that came with the rebuilding of London was the idea that insurance should be available. So an insurance office was part of the creation of the, the new city of London that was built in 1667. Um, in the 1680s, we saw the emergence of business insurance, and that started off with a, an establishment that still exists today, Lloyd's of London. Lloyd's of London started off in, uh, in a coffee shop, in a coffee house of the day, where high net worth individuals would meet, form syndicates, and agree to insure or underwrite 
specified risks. That could be a sailing trip to the New World or a slave trading trip to, to, uh, the, the Af to Africa, the Mediterranean. <clears throat> These uh, high net worth individuals would agree between them to become Lloyd's names. In other words, they would become syndicate members and they would collect a fee they would underwrite and bind that particular contract for the client for the specific perils, specific types of risks. And at the conclusion, if there was no adverse event, they would keep the money. And if there was an adverse event, they would have to go into their personal fortunes in order to be able to pay out the cost of that claim. And to this day, a risk that can't be insured anywhere else can quite possibly be uninsured for a price with Lloyd's. That could include something like Celine Dion's voice or Marilyn Monroe's legs or just about anything that you can possibly think that's worth insuring. <clears throat> Originally its main client was maritime business, so the shipping trade. Today the property casualty and direct insurance business in Canada, according to IBIS World, an IBIS World report that I'm quoting here, is worth over <clears throat> 80 billion dollars. And uh, th that uh, total amount is, well, divided into things like personal and commercial, uh, auto insurance, commercial property, personal property, liability, and other types of insurance. The biggest players in a very fragmented industry include Intact Financial Corporation. I'll come back to those guys in a second. Then we have Desjardins Group in Quebec, Aviva Lloyd's Wawanisa Cooperators. And I mentioned it's quite a fragmented industry and in that there are a lot of smaller players. Many of them are multinational organizations. In fact, on top of this, we even have insurance companies for insurance companies, the reinsurers who will help to distribute the risk by selling insurance against certain types of claims, like a major forest fire where one company might have way too much exposure for their own, uh, for their own good they might decide to reinsure that risk with one of those global reinsurers. So it is very much different than the life insurance business we'll talk about next week. The biggest products in this industry, as I mentioned earlier, include personal and commercial auto insurance policies. And that includes the policies that are sold through government agencies as we have in, in British Columbia with ICBC. Commercial property, personal property, liability, and other insurance make up the rest. The biggest player, <clears throat> as I mentioned, is Intact, which is a name most people wouldn't have been familiar with because Intact is essentially being created by merging a number of other companies and other insurance company interests in consolidation that we've seen over the last few years. Most recently, the RSA Insurance Group, PLC, essentially a, a British company called Royal and Sun Alliance, was merged to as part of Intact. We have uh, other companies like uh, <coughs> uh, like uh, AXA, Allianz, Zurich North, the interests of ING Bank in the insurance business. All of those particular businesses became part of the larger Intact, but still it's only about 14% of the total insurance business. And these are the underwriters. They create a product that is sold by independent brokers who are again very local companies most typically. One other very important detail that I thought I should mention at the very beginning of this session is that we need to distinguish between risk and exposure. What insurance companies essentially do is they observe risk, they measure it, and then they try to figure out what the likely cost of that is. So essentially one of the most important functions in an insurance company is the mathematics or the actuarial function where we determine the probabilities of events. Now, <clears throat> probabilities and a probability distribution is usually two-tailed. We have probability that will do really well and a probability that will do really badly. Insurance companies, quite typically, are only concerned with adverse risk or pure risk, the chance that something's going to go wrong. They're not concerned that your car is going to start performing better. They're concerned you're going to run into a tree and wreck it. So they're concerned with that adverse event. Now, the second concern that they have, if you do have an adverse event, is how much the event's going to cost. Now, how much of it will they have to, to uh, shell out for? Is the risk limited to damage to your car? Do they have to spend $10,000 to fix your car? Less a deductible. So 
Maybe their exposure is limited to $9,000. Or perhaps you're going to run into a school bus and cause several million dollars worth of liability. So the total exposure in many cases <clears throat> will be very significantly different based on the nature of the contract. So today we're going to look at some contracts. And uh, again, a fair warning, this is a big topic. So today's session will take a little while to get through. I thought I'd mention at the very beginning, if you need a break, hit that pause button, go grab a coffee, and you can rejoin us at any point. A couple of important features of, uh, of insurance are, are attached to the risks of ownership. As an owner, you have a risk that you're going to lose your property, property damage or loss. And the second kind of exposure is liability for damages. Property damage <coughs> is something that we think about when we think about home, automobile, snowmobile, boat, motorcycle insurance, tenants insurance. What is the, the risk or the chance and the exposure to you of a particular loss? Maybe your car is not terribly valuable, so you're not concerned about uh, damage. Maybe nobody will even notice if you get in an accident with your car. Or if it's that Lamborghini <coughs> that um, Rowan Atkinson, Mr. Bean, crashed the other day, about a $1.2 million uh, uh, repair bill. If that's the case, then you probably do need to have good insurance. The, uh, the damage... It can also be down to third-party activities like fire, theft, vandalism, hailstorms, and so on. And so that might also be part of that package. Now, under liability, we have a, a much larger list. <clears throat> the personal risk or the personal liability that you might cause um, either through um, pure accident or negligence, carelessness. It's something that's much more likely to be attached to ownership of something like uh, an an automobile, a motorcycle, a property like a building, maybe your dog bites somebody, and those would be the type of things that you could carry liability for. Y your renters <coughs> may also be required to carry some kind of uh, insurance because they may also have liability. Normally when we're thinking about insurance, we're thinking about uh, a, a system that's been set up over a very large period of time to make sure that if an adverse event happens, nobody's going to be hit with so much cost that they can't personally bear it. So if you have a million dollar house, you couldn't afford to replace it if it burned down. So you probably would say, I can afford to bear the cost of $10,000 or $50,000 worth of damage. The remainder would have to be insured. And that insurance would then be spread over thousands of other uh, policies and so for the insurer being able to charge a small amount of money would kind of make sense. In fact e even in very religious societies, in Islamic society, while it is against typically against Sharia law to have uh, some kind of uh, car insurance even because you'd be essentially betting against God, it's allowable that you can have uh, a shared <clears throat> uh, risk between individuals by putting people into individual syndicates. So a, a syndicate or a tackful fund could could then uh, collect a thousand dollars from each person in the group and if nobody gets in an accident they will return the money back to the individuals and if somebody does they will use part of that money to to be able to uh, cover the cost of that individual's claim. That's one of the most standard and ordinary types of insurance, the original idea of risk pooling. The larger the number of people, the more, more, uh, uh, the, the better spread out that risk is going to be, especially if we spread the risk across different classes of investors. For example, if I have an insurance policy that covers all of the people in Kamloops and nobody else, if they're my customers, and we have a fire that wipes out a subdivision in Kamloops, we would never recover from that. So we'll have some clients in Kamloops, a few. We'll have some clients in Vancouver, some clients in Victoria, some clients in Montreal, and so on. So the chance of one large incident affecting <coughs> a lot of our customers is significantly reduced. Of course, for that, we pay the fee. And we pay both the fee to cover the costs and we pay a fee to, to, to compensate the insurance, insurance companies and the underwriters. And it provides us with an indirect protection against certain types of 
hazards. There, there are two elements to the cost of insurance. There's the, the pure cost of insurance, and then there's the cost of running the insurance company, the loading charges. I should say against this, we've also got bounced a significant amount of investment income because when you pay money for an insurance policy, it might take a while for the actual bad event to happen, so they have a lot of money to invest. More on that when we talk about life insurance. Pure cost of insurance essentially is the probability of an event occurring. That's what our actuaries predict. Then they work out the exposure or the cost of compensation based on the value of the loss, the loss of the property, how much is it going to be worth. Then they'll look at the number sharing the risk <clears throat> and we'll have a lower cost for a larger number of policies. This is going to take a look as well at things like the probability of the event occurring. So for example, if you live in a rural forest interface area, a subdivision of Kamloops or Kelowna, let's say, the chances of a fire happening are actually quite high. The chances of them involving a particular neighborhood would be statistically or actuarially um, accessible. So we know the prox proximity of the hazard. We know the flammability of that particular area. But we also know something about whether or not there's fire service available to fight the fire and the likelihood that they'll be successful at saving anything more than the basement from that fire. Now, against these probabilities, the pure risk, we've also got those loading charges. Now, these are the things that will be part of the insurance company's costs, the, the, the commissions that have to be paid to brokers, uh, collecting, managing insurance funds, the cost of settling claims, not the actual loss itself, but the cost of settling the claim. And, of course, we have to compensate our shareholders or our uh, policyholders, in the case of a mutual organization, for investing their money. So some kind of dividend or return on their capital. And, of course, this will be variable from company to company. <clears throat> the next area is going to take a look at risk management. Risk management talks about things like what is the insurable interest, the, the property that we've actually specified. What type of risks, either named or general risks, are we going to insure against? And we'll also talk a little bit about, uh, that, about handling risk. The insurable interest starts off by identifying the object that's going to be insured. And we also have to make sure that we, we identify that... <coughs> that uh, um, there is a, a, a real financial loss that occurs. It's not just, you know, that somebody's feelings have been hurt, but there is a, a quantifiable financial risk. A and that you have to be the person suffering that. For example, I, I could recognize that Stephen is a really bad driver. And as a result of that, I'd say, I want to buy some insurance on his car because, you know, I know he's going to get an accident the way he drives. I, I talk to my broker and they say, you know, sorry, it's Stephen's car. You don't actually have an insurable interest in that vehicle. So while we all recognize that Stephen is a terrible driver, sorry, you know, it, it's called betting. If you're, if you're doing it the other way, this is called insurance. There's a difference. So... It has to be an identifiable financial risk. Now, if I was Stephen's employer, and Stephen was a really important important uh, uh, employee, I could actually get insurance against Stephen killing himself. That would be fine, too. And if I was leasing the car to Stephen, of course, I would also have an insurable interest. But that is an important prerequisite of all kinds of insurance, every kind of insurance. We say that... Uh, <clears throat> the, the risk must occur from, from chance events. In other words, if we know that something is going to happen, if we know that somebody is going to have a, a, a bad outcome, that their, their car is going to be crushed or their house is going to burn down because the fire is already coming down the hill, too late to ensure then. So accidental death is a good example of something that is a chance event. Suicide, on the other hand, is deliberate action, and for that we couldn't get insurance. And I suppose if you could, it would be incredibly expensive. Now, how do we deal with risk? 
Well, there are always several steps. It's almost like a cascade of activities that we can make part of our integrated risk planning. First off, we try to eliminate the risk, avoid it as much as we can. Um, if we're, we're thinking about, for example, the risk of getting into an accident on a snow day in the wintertime. Uh, easiest way to eliminate the risk, stay at home. Decide, nope, I'm not going out today. It's too dangerous to drive. So I, I'm definitely going to eliminate that risk. You, you decide, well, you know, I, I really do need to get into work. So how can I reduce the risk? Well, I, I could take a taxi. Um, let somebody else bear the risk in that case. I can make sure my, my vehicle has really good snow tires or borrow my neighbor's SUV. Um, th those are other ways of reducing risk. Um, say you can't do that, you know you have to take your car and you have to put your car at risk. Well, of course, make sure you've got the insurance that will cover that and then join the, the auto club, do all of those other things as well. And, and then finally, you know, deal with the risk as best you can by yourself. Drive really carefully. Put chains on your car. Uh, drive slowly. Uh, stay off the main routes. All of those things are things that you could do to reduce the chance of, a, of an adverse outcome. And for just about any kind of a risk event, those are the steps that we would go through. Now, of course, having an insurance policy was number three on that list. So after you've tried all those other things, now we need to think about what kind of a policy we need. And this is long and technical. I'm not going to get into all of the details of an insurance policy, but I'll give you a flavor of some of the main headings and some of the terminology that the investment brokers will use. Of course, there's the contract itself. Inside the contract, we have a declaration. I'll go through some of the details of that in just a minute. We have an agreement that specifies certain terms. So again, I'll talk about conditions, endorsements and riders about things that will be and not be in the uh, in the claim and what happens when we want to cancel the policy uh, it seems like to be an insurance company you have to have a cute mascot <clears throat> of some description well m mostly in the United States and once you've set up the company and you've hired a graphic designer to do a, a great uh, mascot for your company you need to be able to put together some legal contracts and the contracts are between the person who's seeking the insurance the insured and the underwriter or the insurance company inside the contract we've got a declaration that specifies the particular items that are going to be insured. And that's where we look for things like a vehicle identification number or a, a property identification number, um, the, the information that you have from the registry office, uh, anything that involves other owners. If we have a mortgage with the bank, if we've got <coughs> co-ownership with a spouse, that information has to be provided. Specific dates and times on which the contract is going to be valid. The compensation, the, the premium, that you're going to pay for the insurance and any limitations on coverage you know for example with my boat I, I know that I I can't go past uh, uh, the Columbia River that's one of the limitations and I can't go any further north than Alaska because that's all written into the coverage I would have to phone my insurance broker and get a, a, a rider to change that coverage for uh, <coughs> uh, it, the insurance agreement itself that's going to be part of the, the written up policy. It'll say the kinds, the perils that are insured against in particular. Any exclusions, perhaps earthquakes and floods might not be part of my property insurance. There might be limitations on liability as well. And we'll talk in particular about some of those conditions in just a minute. There's also going to be some discussion about how settlement is made. Will you get the actual dollar value, the depreciated value of the asset, according to the appraiser who's going to look at your claim? Or will you get the full replacement, what it's going to cost to make you good, to make you whole again after some kind of an adverse event? Policy conditions are the responsibility of the insurer and the insured. So we have to actually identify who the, who's going to do what, uh, what will the insurer provide, what will the insured do. You're responsible for safeguarding your property, for keeping it under cover in the case of a hailstorm. The insurer is responsible for making payments under certain circumstances within a certain period of time. 
th there might even be some information in there about arbitration, how a third party might settle any disputes. There also will be a discussion of what happens at the end of the policy. Will the policy lapse or will you be able to cancel the policy at certain dates or will the policy be voided if you have not met up met your uh, responsibilities? There's also certain information in the contract that may limit the amount of benefit that you get or provide a fixed amount of benefit for certain types of assets. And for this, we talk about things like riders. For example, you have a, you have a sailboat and it has an inflatable dinghy and outboard motor. Those are specifically identified and they're mentioned in the contract so that if you forget to tie your dinghy onto the back of the sailboat <coughs> when you sail away and it drifts off and is never found again, you may actually be able to claim that and receive a certain amount of payment. In fact, it's one of the most common things in the uh, Vancouver Island area to see somebody's dinghy floating around freely and with nobody in it because somebody didn't really tie a good knot when they were dragging it behind their sailboat. Also, there may be um, information about what happens in case of a change in ownership. Uh, so will the insurance policy cover up to a certain point in time? Will the insurance policy be transferable? to a new asset. If you buy a new car, can you actually bring the insurance coverage with you? Um, <clears throat> any particular additions, deletions, what type of notice do you have to provide? Will the insurance company cover that with the existing premium? Cancellation. Well, typically you can cancel an insurance policy at any time. An insurance policy typically runs for a year. You might only own the property for six months or seven months and at the end of that period you're going to probably receive part of your premium back but not all of it so if you receive six twelfths half of your policy back after six months the prorated premium will probably be a little bit less than half you'll have to pay something to cover those uh, origination costs the the uh, fees for the insurance company if you get into an insurance claim the process, well, really a whole new process starts again. You phone up your insurance broker, you've been given a number to call, and you call them and they say, just a moment, I'll put you in touch with our adjuster. The adjusters themselves might be independent or they might be part of the firm. We'll talk about those guys in a second. <clears throat> then we have to look at how the claim will be settled. Will you receive the actual cash value or replacement value? What is the insurer's liability? And we'll talk about something called subrogation in, in just a minute. A adjusters are people that understand the nature of that property. If they're auto insurers, they know how much a car is worth, they know how much the new tires that you put on add value to or don't add value to the vehicle. Um, <clears throat> they may be part of the insurance company or they may be separate individuals and in independent adjusters. It's their job to uh, identify the extent of the damages and report back to the insurance company with a recommendation how to settle that claim. Now, actual cash value essentially says we're going to pay the replacement value minus depreciation. And we describe this as an indemnification. And we're putting you back into the original financial condition you were before the adverse event. So you smashed your car. It was a $30,000 car, but you've had it for five years. So the real value to you might be $20,000, allowing for that depreciation. <coughs> and we can get some of that information from, well, all of those sources that we talk about with car loans, like Auto Trader or Kelly's Blue Book, will give us a value, and it'll talk about the, the retail value. Insurance companies might offer you the wholesale value, but always go for the retail value. And they're negotiable. They don't really want a claim to be dragged uh, dragged out if it can be. Uh, recently, I actually lost a set of winter tires because they were in, in a, a tire shop which burned down. And I just settled the claim. And of course, my tires were four years old. They probably really did need to be replaced. Um, and even the rims were destroyed. Well, the, the, the rims would have lasted for another million kilometers, but the tires were pretty much three quarters gone, I guess. So when I settled that claim, I had to pay a betterment fee. 
basically I had to pay for moving up from four-year-old tires to brand new tires. And so when somebody says betterment, essentially that means that the, the vehicle that you receive is going to be better than the original financial condition of, the, of that vehicle. And so you have to pay the difference. And of course, if you do total a car, they will pay you out a fixed amount, but then they will own the wreck. And typically they won't let you buy it back from them, even if it's a really good wreck, your, your favorite old car. Um, <clears throat> replacement value is something that's very attractive if you buy a brand new vehicle and there's a box on the insurance uh, form that says would you like to pay an extra hundred dollars for full replacement value that means if you smash the car next week instead of getting the depreciated value of that car which actually is quite high in the first year you, you pay a lot of depreciation you would actually get a brand new car so you get full replacement value so you may actually be better off after the crash. Um, they don't count depreciation. You pay an extra premium for that. And so there might be a tick box that says for the first year or two years that you own that new vehicle that you want to get full replacement value. And generally a good idea. The insurance company's liability is always going to be limited, limited by that policy document. So there'll be a limit that says we will pay up to a certain amount. Beyond that, you still have to carry that that uh, risk yourself. Um, so there may be a, a higher cash value of the loss and the cost of repairs might even be higher. And of course most policies come with some type of deductible, an amount that you have to pay before the insurance company pays anything, which means you're still going to be responsible. Of course, higher deductible means a cheaper policy, so many people will decide to be self-insuring for the first part of that claim. And only for really high-value claims would they actually get insurance benefit. I mentioned subrogation before. And essentially, that's part of the process. If you have uh, an insurance company that pays out a claim on your behalf, the insurance company may decide to still go after the other party afterwards, even though it was your loss, now they have the, the right to sue the other party. And for example, your, your nephew borrows, borrows your car without your permission, drives off and gets into an accident. You call your insurance company, they say, yes, we'll sell it. we're happy to settle the claim, there you go, there's the money, and oh, oh yes, uh, we would like you to have your, your nephew charged with, uh, with theft. And you say, well, wait, wait a second. That's my nephew. I can't do that. And they say, well, you know, sorry, that's uh, part of the part of the process. You told us that your nephew didn't have the uh, the right. So after your nephew is charged with theft, then the insurance company sues your your brother-in-law for the uh, for to, to recover the car insurance. And it's not you doing the suing, but they're still going to be pretty upset that you've landed. Uh, the nephew in, in, in trouble with both the courts and with uh, the insurance company. There we go. Now, <clears throat> that's talking about things like car insurance, boat, plane insurance. Other type of property insurance might be subject to different kinds of claims. And the nature of that insurance will be very different for property insurance. Uh, risks include things like uh, accidental risk, like wildfires, uh, smoke damage, uh, water, water damage, wind, hail, falling airplanes, all kinds of things. And of course then there are going to be criminal acts like vandalism or theft. The coverage that we see can be described under several different categories. We have specific risks or named perils, things that we're particularly concerned about like forest fire uh, or hail damage. All risk covers basically all risks except for those that are specifically excluded. And then we might actually have a particular list of things that we, we own that we want to make sure are valued separately, documented separately, and they're insured at a particular value. Now, named peril means, as it says, protection from specific perils listed in the contract, things like hail or... Or, or fire or, or floods uh, and typically we do see this for things like household contents and of course when there's a disaster like some of the disasters that we've seen in BC a lot of the disasters don't cover spe 
specific things like floods might be an issue. We saw in the case of the Calgary floods a few years ago that there were two ways your house could get flooded. You could have floods from the river rising and the water coming in through the doors and the windows. In that case, it's a flood. On the other hand, if the water comes in through the sewage system, through the, uh, through, through the sewer pipes and through your septic field and back into the house, that might be insurable. So people were blocking the doors of their houses with sandbags, stopping the river from coming in through the doorway. Meanwhile, the basements were flooding because of the sewer system. That was an insurable uh, event. A flood with water coming in over the threshold was not. So an, a very important distinction. Now, since insurance companies don't cover things like floods typically, especially if you live in an area that's predisposed to flooding, a floodplain, then you might be relying on things like the government. So for things like the forest fires in Lytton, for example, <clears throat> we have um, a process that we can go through through the government, but there may be a number of different things that are specifically ineligible if you can buy insurance. So if you can buy fire insurance and you didn't, the government probably won't cover you. Wildfires, earthquakes, snow load, windstorms, sewage backup, things like that may not be covered uh, by the government insurance or by the government uh, financial uh, disaster recovery programs. There is information, of course, available if you do find yourself in that situation through the provincial government. Uh, all risks is much more comprehensive than a specified risk type of property insurance policy. Everything except for things that are specifically excluded. For example, hailstorms uh, and hail damage is often specifically excluded. It's a rare event. People say, well, that's okay, we don't get a lot of hail. And then when it happens, they discover, you know, oops, my all risk policy doesn't cover that risk. This is something that we see very, very commonly for, for house insurance. Um, <clears throat> property riders uh, essentially are things that are specifically valuable and individually identifiable. Your Rolex watch, perhaps, uh, the Bang & Olufsen stereo that you have, uh, your stamp collection, your coin collection, some things that might be particularly valuable and specifically identifiable can be put onto a list. And on that list, we start to describe that as our property rider. So we've said to our insurers, yes, thank you, we like the insurance policy, but we want a little bit extra for that particular asset. And I mentioned things like a dinghy on a, on a boat uh, might be specifically insured so that we get the full value in the case of a loss. Um, and, and in cases like that, yeah, things like, in sh like inflation or revaluation might also be particularly mentioned. There may also be a, an inducement to purchase more insurance if you're underinsured by a coinsurance clause. Essentially means that you're going to receive part of that insurance with the other party who you own that uh, asset with. And it, in the case of a mortgage, you own your house in combination with your co your co-owner, the the bank, and so they will settle. the The mortgage lender will settle in the insurance settlement, unless you've already paid off the property. Now, neglect means that there's no payout. So, if, for example, you were to have a criminal act, set your house on fire to collect the money, then you would have no claim on that insurance, but you co-insurer, the mortgage lender, would be, would be entitled to some compensation. Now, remember what I said about subrogation. That doesn't mean the insurance company would not come after you to pay for the money that they had to pay to the mortgage lender. When you have a property uh, insurance policy, there's probably a lot of interesting inventory in your house. It's a really good idea to go around your house and document what that inventory is. So if you, you do keep things like valuables and uh, perhaps some sports memorabilia, perhaps you've got some expensive jewelry, taking photographs or a video walkthrough of the property is a good way to keep that kind of an inventory. So some kind of a record and uh, receipts. You know, not just for the last seven years, but receipts going back forever. 
are another good way of keeping that inventory. Typically, uh, insurance policies do account for inflation, something that you don't have to specifically worry about. Now, the next area is personal liability insurance. You know, that, that old story about, you know, a <clears throat> Bible salesman comes up to your house, trips on the stairs, ends up suing you and wins because you have a responsibility to maintain your house. Well, that's one reason why we have insurance policies. And clearly that's a story that insurance salesmen will tell you over and over again, just to let you know how bad things can possibly be. Personal liability insurance uh, covers things like damage to other people's property, injury to people on your property or around your vehicle, um, <clears throat> liability for all kinds of unspecified claims. It, it'll even partly cover your negligence, unless the insurance company specifically excludes that. Clearly, in a market like uh, the United States, you can see there is a lot of compensation. It's a highly fragmented market with everybody jumping into that from private companies um, like, uh, like Geico, <coughs> owned by Warren Buffett, uh, right down to uh, uh, cooperative organizations like the Auto Association, which will also sell you that insurance. In British Columbia, we have one main insurer who provides uh, all of the uh, insurance for third-party liability with some private insurance also offered, but typically to people who have got um, a, a safer driving record. ICBC kind of picks up the rest. Typical risks of things that found in auto insurance and uh, liability to others. We, we hit a pedestrian, we hit a cyclist, that becomes our liability. Or <laughs> even if a cyclist hits a car, that becomes uh, a liability to others. Personal injury and death claims, uh, damage to our vehicle, damage to the other vehicle. Liability to others is required coverage for driving a car. Uh, Third-party public liability is compulsory in British Columbia in most jurisdictions. Doesn't do anything for you, doesn't cover your injuries, it doesn't cover any damage to your car. So that's the strictly third-party liability coverage. Covers other parties, injury, death, property damage, typically due to your fault, negligence. Uh, in order to be subject to a claim in a, a fault jurisdiction, your negligence has to be proven. So anything that involves um, a traffic ticket, and you know, for this, we often see the, the police being used as an agent of the insurance company, gathering information after an accident, not just for curiosity or statistical purposes, but because that's required in the police report in order to initiate an insurance claim. Insurance insurers will be limited by policy limits, so there might be a million dollars, two million, or three million dollar policy limits. If you run into somebody's uh, old uh, <clears throat> Toyota Corolla and damage a couple panels, clearly you're going to be well covered. But if you get into an accident that involves a, a physical uh, injury to somebody that might uh, restrict their ability to earn for the next 30 or 40 years and reduce their, their, uh, their family well-being, that could be a multi-million dollar claim. So if you go beyond that limit, you're responsible for the remainder. Negligence falls into a couple of categories. Or ordinary negligence is failing to do what's reasonable, um, or failing to protect somebody against your unreasonable activities. Gross negligence is not just a, a problem for insurance, but maybe also be a criminal uh, act. So reckless, wanton, willful misconduct. That road rage, road rage incident is not going to be ordinary negligence. That involves willfulness. Um, <clears throat> so there may be uh, that there may may be consequences that go beyond insurance in that case. Um, personal injury or death death. Um, well, um, clearly that's going to be something that may affect people that are in your car, people that are struck by your car. And uh, <clears throat> in that case, there will also be some kind of medical insurance or accident benefits. Again, within the limits of the insurance policy, which, as we'll talk about later, is actually now quite restricted in British Columbia. 
we have a type of no-fault, not a pure no-fault system, but at least a partial no-fault system in British Columbia where payments are made without reference to fault. Um, payments are made um, to you, the policyholder, and also to all kinds of third parties. Um, things like disability income, medical payments, death ben benefits, funeral expenses may all be also be part of that basic coverage. Um, under the damage to vehicle, well, uh, there's coverage against the specified risks like theft or uh, vandalism. If there, if that's the case, then it's typically reimbursed at the actual cash value, subject to deductible. So, not the full replacement value, but the the, the depreciated value. Um, in a no-fault situation or a pure no-fault situation, as we'd find in a place like Manitoba, payments are made without reference to anybody's particular negligence or fault. Um, types of physical damage can be part of an all, all peril, perils where everything is covered, specified perils which might exclude certain types of things, uh, collision, comprehensive that include things like tire damage or a windshield claim. Uh, all perils means everything and more uh, and uh, <clears throat> all specified perils, all collision, all comprehensive. Specified perils might mention certain types of risks, but not all. F a fire and theft, for example, might be something that you have as part of a, an automotive storage policy. You're keeping your car in the garage, you're worried about the garage burning down. You decide that you're going to get some kind of coverage for your vehicle, but you're not worried about a windshield claim or tire damage while your car's parked in the garage or stored in the garage. Collision insurance coverage, uh, when your car hits uh, another car or another object, or, or even a rock falling off the side of the mountain. <clears throat> so uh, that can include things like uh, one, one vehicle accidents. You know, your car was hit by a tree, and that tree just jumped out in front of you, or even running into the ground. Uh, if the collision is caused by another driver's negligence, you're in insurance company is going to, to pay the damage claim regardless of fault and even pay the deductible and then is going to enter through a proce into a process of dealing with the other other party in a fault jurisdiction. Not such a problem in, uh, in British Columbia. Comprehensive insurance basically covers uh, perils to your car from in just about everything else. Vandalism, fire theft, lightning, wind, um, uh, major stone damage, stone chip damage, um, and again, subject to some kind of a deductible. The insurance rates that are charged typically are going to vary according to certain factors, limited in some places. For example, in British Columbia, we have very little discrimination by age, but in other places, and for comprehensive or th private uh, third party insurance, we uh, may also see some kind of benefits to being older. Uh, gender might make a difference, so being a 21-year-old male, single, would definitely be a, a, a cost factor in some particular markets. And if you're driving a, a, a very powerful car, you know, that Lamborghini, that could be an issue as well. Uh, used for driving for work, driving to work, important distinctions. Driving for work, you probably see some ad some additional benefit. Driving to work, probably not so much. Pleasure only, you might also pay a higher rate. Um, the, uh, the, the area, the, the postal code that you live in, that you store the vehicle in, is also going to be part of the pricing factor because certain certain areas do have, uh, have higher cost claims. No fault provisions uh, in areas like ours don't require f uh, an admission or proof of fault, and they don't require a any kind of um, a negligence in order to be paid out. That doesn't mean that that's not assessed as part of the accident report. It means that the payout will remain the same whether you're determined to be 100% at fault, 50% at fault, 75% at fault, or not at fault at all. This removes the litigation costs, which are considered to be one of the most expensive 
carrying costs of insurance policies. For that reason, organizations like ICBC have fought very hard to try to remove that requirement of fault because the insurance companies will get involved and push for higher settlements for things like um, th things like um, uh, um, pain and suffering. So not only did you have an accident, but you lost work, you missed a promotion. And so those costs can quickly exceed the value of all the property loss and all of the cost of the medical treatments that are required. Uh, and so if we do end up in a situation like we have now, there is no right to sue. In fact, recently talking to uh, one uh, <coughs> personal injury lawyer who had a major practice in Vancouver decided it would be a really good time to retire because his business was largely destroyed by ICBC pushing for that uh, pushing for reduction in the ability to sue for benefits so you can see from this this table from the Insurance Bureau of Canada 2021 fact sheets there's the hyperlink at the bottom you can check you'll see that there is actually a, 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 a a pretty thorough explanation of how our sort of no-fault system works in British Columbia. That's an awful lot. We've s managed to do that in less than an hour. I'm quite pleased by that. You might want to take a look at again at some of the details, the material that's covered in in Chapter 7 from uh, the Madura and Gill textbook will also be very useful. We're all going to need uh, property and casualty insurance at some time. So everybody will have some exposure. You need to understand how much insurance you need because having too much insurance can be a, a significant cost in your budget. Not having enough insurance can have significant effects on your life. We might also require insurance because other parties will require it. Our, our landlord might require that vehicles have a certain type of insurance in order to be able to use their parkade or a marina might require liability insurance in order to keep your boat in their marina. Um, banks will require it for certain kinds of assets because they have a financial interest in that asset and if you lose it or if it's destroyed before the end of the loan they will be out some of their collateral. For financial institutions not only is it going to protect some of their property that they have an interest in, but they may also be responsible for selling some of that insurance. So there is a tendency for financial institutions to probably oversell, although they would never say that insurance in order to make sure they're protected. And uh, governments will require it, especially in the case of things like car insurance, because if, if there is going to be some kind of uh, a, a financial disaster or catastrophe that uh, is going to result in thousands of vehicles being damaged by hailstorm perhaps or uh, major car pileups causing uh, millions of dollars of damage they don't want that to have an effect on the overall economy this has been a very brief and somewhat superficial view of property and casualty insurance I hope that it's going to be beneficial if you're interested in this topic I really encourage you to dig a little bit deeper and I'll see you in our next session thank you very much mm -hmm.